Yeah, so I'm here to talk about TimeScale, which is a time series database uh, built on top of Postgres. And so let me give you a little bit of background first about us. Um, the reason we built this product is we believe that the data industry is undergoing a generational shift. And the data industry really started out in the 1970s with the relational databases like Oracle or DB2. And the purpose here was mostly business intelligence and business processing. But then the internet came along and there was a huge explosion of data. And so the original uh, kind of a relational approach really didn't scale and Hadoop and Cassandra came into the mix. These were really products, so-called NoSQL, um, that were meant to handle the deluge of new data that came along with the internet. But we are having even more data um, explosion now with the rise of machine data. Uh, IDC expects 44 zettabytes of data a year by 2020. And just as one data point, a single car can create as much as 25 gigs of data an hour. And so this is really the era of time series data. And most people here, I would guess, think of time series data and the data center and DevOps use case where it's used for monitoring. But we're seeing it all over the place with industrial machines where you know heavy industries want to do operational analytics and they want to uh, do predictive maintenance. Uh, we're seeing it in transportation and logistics where we all need help figuring out where our Amazon packages are. Um, and we're seeing it in you know all these other applications as well. And so what is really time series data? It is characterized by mostly workloads that are insert heavy, uh, and the inserts are associated with a timestamp in some kind of recent time interval, however that's defined. It's big. Uh, you have both high interest rates and large amounts of data, and it's rich and complex because you, you have the full history of your entire system, you could really do quite neat analytics on top of that data and get a lot of insights. And this data really doesn't live in a vacuum. It's really data that is connected with other types of data, like relational or geospatial data. If you think of a device, right, it's, uh, associated with manufacturer information, is associated with parts information, that's kind of relational data. And also, even stationary devices have important geospatial dimensions, not to mention your cell phone that moves along. And so, um, before time scale, all the other time series databases are now SQL, which only supported the time series modality. And so your application had to worry about, uh, you know, joining this data with a relational database or a geospatial database at the application layer, which created a lot of complexity uh, uh, for your application layer. In time scale DB, you could use the regular SQL joins to do this kind of processing inside the database. But how, did, uh, how were we able to create a database that, is, that works in all of these modalities? And uh, we really harness the power of open source here. Actually, our database is created as an extension on top of Postgres, which is an Apache 2 licensed open source database to create a new database product that supports time series data, along with the traditional data that Postgres supports. And importantly, we're not a fork of Postgres, we're an extension where, where you're able to install us inside the database and extend the database to create all this new 
functionality. So not only are we an open source project ourselves, we are also built on top of an open source project. And so what are the advantages of this approach? Well, we didn't have to rebuild a lot of stuff from scratch. We kind of stand on the shoulders of giants. We inherited a huge ecosystem of connectors and tools because anything that already works with Postgres works with us. And in terms of APIs for programmers, if your programmer knows SQL, it's kind of trivial to work with us because we are just SQL. And so, so but how do you extend something that has been around for a very long time and is very mature? Well, you have to find something different about the problem that you are trying to solve. And really the insight we have here is that time series workloads are different, right? Traditional relational data is uh, primarily updates that are distributed across random portions of your key space. Think of your uh, banking application, all right? You have a credit and debit to kind of random account numbers. In contrast to that, time series data is primarily inserts to recent time. And so uh, we figured out that you could leverage this property of the workload to build a much more efficient storage specifically for time series data. So here's a picture of data coming in over time, right? And because the uh, most of the work happens at the most recent time interval, uh, the major approach that we took is that we partition the data by time. So by time and optionally other dimensions, but time is really the important one. And therefore, each kind of box within this dimensional space, each partition becomes its own table and is implemented as its own table. And if you choose the right sizes for your chunks, what you can make happen is that the most recent partitions, your most recent chunks are in memory. And so all of the parts where you are undergoing heavy modifications, that's gonna be now memory resident. And that's much more efficient to operate on. And we do this all automatically for you. So you insert your data, it automatically gets routed. We automatically create new partitions. To the user, we create this abstraction called a hypertable, which from the SQL layer looks mostly like a table. And we do all of the other work underneath for you. Uh, the other thing we changed in, in how Postgres operates is uh, the way we um, access data. So not only is data usually written by time, when you query it, there's often a time predicate. And given that we partition by time, we could exclude entire partitions from ever being considered for our query because Given this query, which only looks at data for the last seven days, a partition for data 30 days ago doesn't even need to be looked at. And this is actually a very effective uh, query speed up technique. Uh, so, I mean, we have users big and small, but just to give you one example, Cray, which is a supercomputing company, probably as old as IBM. Um, we actually don't sit on crays. We sit on the computers that sit next to crays that monitor the cray machines. Uh, but what they did was they created new chunks every five minutes. And uh, kind of at the city state, they have 50,000 chunks on their machines. So if you have a particular time period, just by partition exclusion, you could look at the one fifty thousandth of your data instead of your entire data set. The, uh, Cray doesn't use any indexing. 
or anything at all. The only thing it uses is this kind of partition exclusion thing. And you can see that they're getting pretty massive query speedups. Um, the third principle is data changes as, as it ages, right? Uh, and the way you use data changes as it ages. When data is recent, you often want to look at particular entries or dive deep to debug very fine grain details. As data ages, you're gonna be looking at statistical results based on a large time horizon. And so your needs change. And so you might want to, for example, reorder your data to be um, kind of co-located on disk instead of by time, by device, or in some other method to aid the system in this kind of a, um, <clears throat> a change in how you query it. And one of the cool things we added was continuous aggregation policies, which is this idea that if you're gonna be looking at aggregates over your data over large time horizons, one of the techniques you can do is you can materialize these results ahead of time. Because remember, all the data doesn't change much. And so by materializing uh, these results, you really speed up your queries. And so we have a entire, you know, background automation framework that does this for you once you create a view. Uh, okay, design principle number four is we could reuse other parts of the open source ecosystem um, to build uh, uh, scalability solutions. Um, so here we could leverage a Postgres streaming replication to give you full HA and uh, scale out reads just by leveraging the streaming replication that Postgres provides. And we can use other projects like Patroni, which is a project that automatically manages those clusters, does failover, uh, does HA, uh, and this just works right out of the box for us right now. But also we're now in the process of building uh, out, uh, you know, horizontal sharding. And here um, we, uh, we can leverage the fact that the underlying systems here have some integration for things like um, two-phase commit, right? So we don't, again, we can't just use it as is, but we can use parts of it. We don't have to reinvent the entire system. And this is really the, the key advantage of using, uh, of building on top of open source. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we've been developing a scale out rights for only a year we're getting already, you know, a production of a system with pretty good results. This, if you were to develop this from scratch, it would take you multiple years to, to get this. Um, in terms of like lower level, de uh, lower level details about how we manage the project, we post our code up on GitHub. So it's, you know, you can view the source code and we also track issues via GitHub. In terms of building the community, we found that actually having a Slack channel is, is absolutely wonderful for community engagement. Uh, in terms of, uh, this might be particular to the database space, but we also found like we recently launched a database as a service, which allows you to uh, really quickly um, spin up a database and get a connection. And that's also really great for having people to get started quickly using your product instead of having to install it 
and set it up themselves and all of this. And if you guys are interested, I have some uh, credits I could give after that as well. 